Dale Takitimu. Dale is an Indigenous rights and environmental lawyer who has led her iwi te whanau apanui in their struggle against deep sea drilling permits off the East Coast. She holds a law degree from Victoria and is a graduate of the United Nations World Intellectual Property Ac Academy in Geneva. She has lectured in commercial law and treaty jurisprudence and has presented at the Māori Legal Forum, the Envir Environmental Law Forum, the International Indian Treaty Council, and at the United Nations Treaty, treaty Expert Seminar hosted by the Cree Nation. She is currently researching climate change law, is actively involved in biodiversity policy development, and acts as a negotiator for her tribal nation. She continues practice as a legal advocate, representing an array of clients in Indigenous, treaty and environmental issues. Through her Indigenous rights law firm, October Law, she represents clients in civil court, direct negotiations, mediation, joint venture relationships between iwi and industry, and as a spokesperson at various United Nations meetings. She's a trustee of the Aotearoa Indigenous Rights Trust and champions the Declaration of the Rights of Indigenous Peoples and the Draft Declaration of the Rights of Mother Earth. She's passionate about her Indigenous rights, seeking and speaking Indigenous truths and challenging colonial fictions. Dale's iwi te whanau apanui have supported her leadership in opposition to the expl exploratory oil drilling permits granted in 2007 for the Raukumara Basin. Many other iwi and environmental groups throughout the country now stand in solidarity with the iwi te whanau apanui on this issue. Nō reira e te iwi, homai ko te pakipaki, Dale. Uh, kia ora tato. I'm not sure who wrote that, uh, but really I'm just a kid from the East Coast. Uh, and uh, more importantly, I'm a Māori mother, uh, and that's what makes me passionate about climate change and environmental issues and about honouring our ancestors and honouring our truths. Because all of a sudden, that conceptual, mythical mukopuna of tomorrow that we talk about has become a reality for me. I can see that in the eyes of my three-year-old baby running around telling me who's boss. And I am deeply concerned as a Māori mother about the tomorrow she will inherit. So I would like first of all to pay tribute to those people in the room and I have to confess that I have got some serious stomach flipping going on at the moment by the caliber of the people in the room, including some people who taught me more than 20 years ago and really, it must be said, had a blank canvas to work with at that point. Um, and so my first framework uh, about I suppose indigenous rights and treaty truths um, came really as a 17 year old who knew nothing and was fortunate enough to be sitting in a whare where Moana Jackson walked in and spoke to us about the treaty and about our tipuna's reality. Uh, and that became the first framework from which I knew about the Treaty of Waitangi. I didn't have what I later learned in law school to be the orthodox theory of the treaty given to me by the principles coming out of the crown machine in Wellington. Instead, they needed to fit into Moana's framework and that was obviously problematic from that point onwards. And I am grateful, I'm grateful for that, for that fateful turn of events. Uh, and there's many others in this room that have influenced. I, I really have no original ideas of my own, I should say that up front. Um, <laughs> but in that collective knowledge tradition we have, I'll gladly stand up here and claim some for the next half an hour. Um, but I would like also to pay honour and respect to our international visitors who have travelled here and really um, 
bestowed upon this meeting um, their expertise. <clears throat> I won't tell you, I don't have a beautiful name, my, my tribe call me. Um, I won't tell you what they call me at home because I doubt it's as beautiful as the name my indigenous sisters people have bestowed upon her and I will make a note for that to take home to the East Coast and say, look at these conferences, I need to know what you might call me, but I'm scared what the answer might be. <laughs> but I would like, uh, first of all, to pay tribute to the theme of the conference, Hemanoa Whenua. Very, very important that we move away from a human-centric space in talking about indigenous rights and indigenous research. Um, and I think it is important too because I myself have experienced the hostility of the Iwi Leaders Forum when we raise issues of environmental crisis, climate change, the threats of deep sea oil, the threats of the mining extractive industries that are being permitted by this government. And really there we have some hostility in the sense that people are in what I would call a state of survival at the moment, cultural survival, survival of our people at the moment. We're trying so dearly to hold on to that and the hostility I'm talking about is not necessarily intentional, but we have people fixated at the moment on treaty settlements and treaty extinguishments and checks under the table. And what that means is that the constant rhetoric a child like me gets thrown back is those things you're talking about, climate change, we'll deal with them off in the future. What we're dealing with now is building an economic base for our people. What we're dealing with now is health and social services for our people. Some people that are committed to constitutional change and some people that are committed to making new frames for treaty settlements or, or, or new mechanisms within the current treaty settlement frame may even go so far as to say they are committed to the fight to self, of self-determination first. My question is, where exactly will you be exercising your self-determination? Because this earth is in crisis and we are killing it as fast as our colonizers are, make no mistake. We are part of the oil addiction. We are absolutely part of the problem. And I say that as an indigenous mother we need to get real about the fact that this is on our doorstep right now. Right now, there are people in the Pacific, Melanesia, Micronesia that have become climate refugees. A new term in the law, and the law is something that increasingly I am becoming despondent with, but new term in the law is called climate migration. And it's a famous thing that the law fraternity does when a new problem arises, we come up with a new term for it. We don't fix the problem, we come up with a new definition and then we spend 20 years arguing about the definition. Climb migration is our extinction of genetic races of people. And this is happening throughout Melanesia and Micronesia today. Today. If any of you have the opportunity to get out a DVD or download it off the internet called Sun Come Up. Sun, like bright shining rays of the sun. Sun Come Up. It is the story of the Claritet Island people. It is the story of climate change and its impact on their culture. And we, humanity, have made them extinct as a distinct genetic people. They have had to leave their tribal homeland, their island homeland, because they can no longer grow food there. Because the salt water from the rising oceans that industrialization has caused means that they can no longer grow the food that they relied on. They were starving, their children were starving, surviving some of them on one coconut per day. And so they decided we will go out there and we will look for somewhere to relocate our people because we just can't sustain life here. 
And so they went to their whanaunga and other islands in the Papua New Guinea group, and they begged, and they begged, and they begged. And I can tell you the movie will make you cry. We watched it in my master's program on climate change law. I was the only one crying. But they went to other whanaunga of theirs in different islands and said, will you take us in? And they said, well, we'd like to, but it's our whenua. And we kind of need it for our mokopuna. So they went again and again and again. They sent out a young group of ambassadors to find themselves a new place to live. And this group of rangatahi, younger than myself, had the task of finding a place to ensure the survival of their people. Finally, a mountain people took mercy on them and said, you can come here and we'll allocate you a space of land over there. But what's needed to happen is they've needed to merge with those new people socially. And there's a lot of warfare where they've gone to. And so over time, their distinct language and their distinct culture and their distinct protection and kaitiakitanga over their lands has been extinguished. And they have needed to merge and become part of a new people. That is the climate change reality impacting, not in a faraway place, far off in the future, in our backyard. And for a lot of people like mine and Te Whanau Apunui and other people around the country who are coastal people, this is going to impact. It's not a matter of saying, we'll just go down with the ship and we will hold our breaths and hope Mother Nature has mercy on us. This is going to impact on our people. In Te Whanau Apunui, we have 14 marae. We, by climate change projections, very conservative projections, will need to move 13 of those in the next 15 years because most of them are just across the road from the beach. And if anyone here has visited that hallowed ground of Te Whanau Apunui, you will know we have a very, very small strip of land to live on. We're coastal people primarily. We will need to move inland and reformulate our identity. We will need to move into the mountains. But our friends at the national government have got different ideas about that because they are busy giving exclusive mineral permit explorations to companies to frack and exploit minerals through the watershed of the Rokumara Ranges. The Rokumara is under siege from this government. And just in case anyone gets romantic ideas from the government before it and the government before that. While we knew that we had to fight deep sea oil coming in the Rokumara Basin, and the reality for us was very clear. Six o'clock news, the day they announced the permit, on the 1st of June, 2010, the first news story was the spill in the Gulf of Mexico. And the BP horizon rig that they just couldn't stop spewing oil for months and months. All of the military might, all of the expertise of the United States, and they couldn't stop that. Jerry Brownlee, my whanaunga heke aparata, and the national government seem to think New Zealand's got better expertise than that, despite the fact we've only got three little boats less than the size of this stage to stop any oil spill at sea. And those that watch the Rena spill will know New Zealand is grossly under-equipped. They then followed up with the next news story, Jerry Brownlee, signing the Petrobras permit, John Key standing behind him, patting him on the back. That was my reality. And then the phone started ringing from the media, asking us what Te Whanau Apunui thought. I can't probably repeat here what I thought. But how dare they? How dare they come into my tipuna's backyard and my mukapuna's future and think that their pursuit of money is enough for me to hang up 
my indigenous truth and let them destroy everything we hold dear. When we started the fight against deep sea oil and we called an emergency, we are iwi within two days down at Kauaitango here. We had a stark choice about standing up for our survival as a people. This wasn't about money for us. And quite often we were asked, you know, is it about the royalties? What if you go into joint venture with Petrobras? Other insulting questions like that like we would sell our mokopuna's birthright and we would sell the mana of our people and we would sell the mana of our tuakana. And so we said, yeah, no, sorry, our mana is not for sale. And Papa Tuanuku is not for sale. And while we're at it, Tangaroa isn't either. And so from there, we were escorted from parliament by security. <laughs> And we said, we'll see you on the front line because you've left us no choice. The treaty partnership you talk about is dysfunctional and we are in an abusive relationship. And if any one of my whanaunga came to me and described their personal relationship the way I would describe the treaty relationship, physically abusive, emotionally abusive, spiritually abusive, it ignores our cultural realities, it ridicules us, what would you say to her? Kick him to the curb. Get rid of him. And I've said that to some of my whanaunga when they've been in relationships like that. But in our treaty relationship, which my people are very passionate about, our tipuna made a commitment that we stand by and honour despite the abuse that we're suffering generation after generation because they believed in a vision of coexistence. But their vision didn't mean that our truths are not relevant. And so we decided that we would stand up and stand united as an iwi. And part of my presentation, which actually I just... Um, have totally ignored. Um, <laughs> I, I just really prepared it as a security blanket because um, I was nervous. I'm still nervous. I'll just talk my way through the nervousness and somebody will ding the bell very shortly. Um, we were called all sorts of things. We were called scaremongers. That was heck yeah. <laughs> we were called irrational. That was Jerry, big Jerry. Jerry Brownlee told me, this is out past the 12 nautical mile limit, that's a treaty-free zone. <laughs> Be careful about things like that that are filtering into policy because John Key repeated that same phrase to me 12 months after that. And I said to him, sweet as, sweet as, let me just start reading the treaty because it's a very small document. Let me start reading it from the preamble, and you just stop me where it says 12 nautical miles, <laughs> and whanau apunu will pack our bags and walk out the door. When it says, my tipuna agreed that those protections over our environment, our kainga, our papa kainga, our lands, forests, fisheries, that they would stop at 12 nautical miles. Jerry didn't want me to read the treaty to him. And uh, we've got quite a long-standing relationship now with security. <laughs> uh, basically, we were called radicals, the haters and wreckers. We were called anti-development. And I can tell you, no, I'm not anti-development. I am anti-greed. And I am anti recklessness, and I am anti-cultural extinction, and I am anti-genocide, and yes, I'm anti-destruction. It's probably not a radical notion, but I'm anti-abuse of my whakapapa. I'm anti-abuse of my tuakana. I'm anti-abuse of Mother Earth, and I'm anti-ecocide, and I'm anti-us failing 
our mokopuna and our duty to be good ancestors. So in that sense, we needed to start talking as an iwi about what our position would be. And of course, the Crown start their discussions by saying, well, the, the Crown Minerals Act says that that all belongs to us and we've got the exclusive right to allocate that resource. And I went, huh? When did my tipuna give consent to the Crown Minerals Act? Why are we even playing in that ballpark? And then some sharp Crown lawyer said, that comes as the result of the Petroleum Act. And I said, well, where did that come from? They said, oh, that came from a royal proclamation. I said, oh, what's that all about? Royal proclamation passed in England six years before the signing of our treaty. Well, we didn't really have much to do with it. That said, basically because the crown in England was considered the most precious, the sovereign considered the most precious, all of the most precious things of the earth should be reserved unto that sovereign. So the gold and the silver, petroleum, uranium, those sorts of things, they should all be bestowed to that sovereign. You can imagine me trying to explain that to our komatu at home. They just went, huh? Oh, well, we'll make a proclamation then. <laughs> so we did. <laughs> so we did. And to do that, we needed to go back to our frame about our truth. And we didn't ever start our discussions about deep sea oil at the Crown Minerals Act. So we went back to our frame, to our indigenous truth, where we put spirituality and Tao Tūrua in the middle of our world. And our rights are defined in relationship to that core. And then we, from there, basically took the position that we would need to do all we could to protect Tao Tūrua, because that was core to our being. <clears throat> we had a look at the frames that the coloniser and the government were using and what they were telling us our ancestors' treaty meant. And I can tell you when I was sitting around a room and hearing from one person in an Australian accent and another person in a South African accent what the treaty meant, it was difficult to remain diplomatic. But I know what my ancestors' treaty meant to them because it's in our truth. It's in the waiata we sing, particularly the waiata that say, Toku mana Māori, he mana Māori motuhake. I heke i homaira, i a toi te huatahi. It doesn't talk about, funnily enough, our mana coming from Wellington. So from that position, we decided, because we're sort of, you know, look a lot at prophecies, I suppose, in Te Apuni, and looked at the words of Aparahama Taunui, who warned not to cloak the treaty in the flag of England. It wasn't, funnily enough, just about a piece of fabric, a fabric flag that was as much a philosophical warning than anything else. We need to stop buying into the fiction that the Crown gets to define what our treaty meant. And seriously, if I hear one more Māori saying that that is a treaty of session, it's really hard when you hear our own buying into the fictions. We need to hold on to what we know, what we believe in, our oral tradition, our history, our reality, our way of being, our worldviews, and our dreams. The way we dream and what we dream is distinct unto us. And we asked uh, Moana to have a look at the foreshore and seabed framework that we had negotiated before we took it back to our iwi to see if they would endorse it or not. And we asked him to be honest, so it wasn't about our ego as negotiators. 
It was about whether it would be good enough for our mokapuna. And I'm not ashamed to admit it didn't measure up. So we didn't sign it. Minister Finlayson's still wondering <laughs> why we didn't sign it. Um, it didn't measure up. We tried to go back and renegotiate it so it would, and it just couldn't, so we abandoned it. But from there, we had to look at basically the advice we were being given, and you don't, I, I think it's important from a research and a, and a negotiation point of view, don't ask for advice and peer review unless you're prepared to take that seriously. So insulting for people to ask you for your opinion and then just ignore it. But one thing I remember that day Moana said to us is they want us to believe that our ancestors were stupid. To believe in that, to buy into that. You know, that on the 5th of February, we had our mana motuhake on the 6th of February, we signed it away. They want us to believe that. Either it was a really big night out in Waitangi on the 5th, <laughs> and people were too hung over to show up on the 6th, or somehow something, some sort of divine intervention had happened. We would fight against neighboring iwi to protect that mana, but we would sign it away on a piece of paper on the 6th of February like something miraculously happened that day. And so this orthodox theory of the treaty that's being given to us needs to be challenged all the time because we need to champion our tipuna. We need to believe in them and we need to honour them. We need to honour them by maintaining our truths. And when we do that, we have to do it all the way, not just half of the way, not just in a way that colours up research or a way that colours up our position. We have to do it all the way, not just accept token references or ourselves within someone else's frame. <clears throat> we have to be pono. We have to be pono, not just at the beginning of a project, but every step of the way we have to ask ourselves, does this honour our indigenous truth? Or has this somewhere along the way slipped in to a colonial fiction? Are we winding up? Okay, I'll wind up very, very quickly. <clears throat> in doing so, I think we need to be courageous and we need to say that we will stand up for Te Aotearoa, for its beauty and its dignity. And we need to put the words and the poems and the waiata into practice. Don't call Papa Tuanuku your earth mother if you aren't prepared to respect her, if you aren't prepared to protect her, if you aren't prepared to live in harmony with her. And when you do it, and you make a stand, and you take your position based on your truth, don't move away from it. Don't apologize for it. Don't ask permission for it. Put your truth into practice and live it and breathe it. Climate change and the way forward depends on us doing that, not just for indigenous people, but for humanity and for this planet. We have to make sure indigenous worldviews are not just an academic exercise. We have to live them every day. Kia ora.